And um, we're in one, one place above, up in Galilee. I don't remember the name of it, but you could see the whole Sea of Galilee. And we were sitting there, and I was playing my guitar and just, you know, making up some chords and just sitting there. And, you know, it was a beautiful day and a beautiful time. And so it would be awesome to see your face, brother, as you get to see all of that and uh, some of you that haven't got to go. Amen. Amen. Yes. It's beautiful. Yeah, I didn't, you know, whenever I went, I, I asked the Lord, you know, Lord, why are you bringing me over here? And I didn't know why. And as I, you know, kind of mused with that thought, I was reading my Bible on the, on the way over on the plane. And I felt led to read Nehemiah. So I turned to Nehemiah, opened it up. And my eyes found the space that said this, Because you have kept my word, I will bring you into the land. And I thought, that's why he's bringing me. Not because I'm good, because he's good. And we came in, and I, had, I got something I never had before. I got a love for the people and a love for the land like I never had. And it was a, um, a great experience and a, a truly a blessing in my life. Amen? And so this morning, very, very familiar scripture, but I don't know how that will turn in the end, but... 1 Samuel chapter 17. Very familiar. And it's dealing with David and Goliath. Amen? Everybody know, I guess everybody knows about David and Goliath. Everybody's heard the story. But this morning my thought is, I guess you could say, would be a holy war. Holy War. John Bunyan read a, wrote a book called Holy War. And there was um, many allegories and many you know, things that he would talk about in the book. And as, I, as only he can do, and he picked such a picture, um, it got me started in thinking and I began to look around and then all of a sudden it just seemed to pop up everywhere and in many scriptures and in the, when I'm listening to the you know, whatever I'm doing, war, and, and this is coming up. And um, so it led me to this train of thought. So we're going to read some. I'll probably read um, most of the chapter, but not all. Chapter 17, verse 1 says this. And the Philistines assembled them, their armies for battle, and they were gathered to Sukkoth of Judah, and pitched between Sukkoth and Azek. And, the, and Saul and the men of Israel had gathered and pitched in the valley of Elah, and set the battle in order against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And a champion named Goliath came out of the Philistines' camp. He was from Gath. His height was about six cubits in a span. And a bronze helmet was upon his head, and he was armed with scaled armor, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And the greaves of bronze were upon his legs, and a bronze javelin slung from his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And the shield bearer went in front of him. And he stood and he cried to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, Why have you come out to set in a battle in order? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man for you and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our slaves and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man and we will fight together. And Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine, and they were dismayed and they were greatly Afraid. I'm going to stop there just for now. So my thought this morning is holy war. Last week when we were here and we were praying and you know we had a time like we did a minute ago where uh, there were some people over here to pray for. I walked up to Brother Ken and I had something on my heart and I just, I said, Brother Ken, I need your prayers this morning. I said, I don't know how to walk this out. I don't know how to walk it out. And so I'm, I'm wrestling and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I didn't tell Ken anything. And he says, you know, Brother Tom, he said, I really think I have a word for you. He said, God said, quit looking to the past. He's not going to do it like he used to do it. He's going to do something new. 
And see, Ken didn't know that I'd been reading books on revival and reading books on these men that had revivals. And I've been reading all this old literature and I've been looking in the past and trying to draw experiences and all this stuff off of that. And God had so told me that in a still small voice. I kept thinking as I'm reading this and searching all these different areas and books and even the scriptures that God wasn't going to do it like that. To stop looking in the past. God's going to do something new and God's got to have somebody new to do it in. And so I'm thinking about this and I go to Ken and he says that and I know it's the word of the Lord because it's confirmation what God done told me. And so this morning, this is my thought. I seen all of Israel and they're on one mountain and all the Philistines are on the other mountain and they're there and they're all the flags are flying and they're in battle array and they're going to fight. So the, this great champion would come down in the, in the valley between these two mountains and he would charge and challenge all of Israel to come down, send a man that we may fight. Now, no doubt he was roughly around nine feet tall and he was fully armored. And he comes down and he's got a, you know, a, a javelin that's probably nine or ten feet long and he's got a shield that, you know, who knows how heavy and how thick this shield was. So he would come down and he looks very intimidating. And for 40 days, the Bible says he called to Israel. And every time that they heard this man, what did they do? They run and they hid in the trenches. And this is what I thought. You know what they're doing in the trenches? They're reading about how to fight. You know what they're doing in the trenches? They're teaching, they're training themselves how to fight. They're talking about war. They're talking about fighting. They're talking about this Goliath. But nobody will actually go down into the valley and fight the giant. We're all reading about revivals. We're all reading about holy war and and going out and doing something mighty for God. But we keep reading and we're not doing anything. That was my thought. And then the book of Hebrews says this. The time is past when we shouldn't be teachers sitting being taught again, but we should start teaching. And so my thought this morning is on a holy war. And so as I was reading the scriptures and reading books, I thought, why don't I just shut this stuff up and walk out there and go and do it? Because that's what was going on in the camp of Israel. They were men there. Now, listen, when you get David in the in the scene of being the king, he talks about all these valiant men. Some of those valiant men were there when David was there. So some of these valiant men that David will list in the Hall of Fame of Scripture, they were actually there under King Saul as well, but they would not and did not do anything. They were back in the trenches. You know what a trench is? When old preacher said it's a grave with both ends kicked out. Amen? That's what it is. They're entrenched. And so my thought this morning is holy war. What does it look like? That's what I told the Lord. What does it look like? You know, when I read of... I was reading about the 1904 Welch Revival and how it started. And, and this young man, you know, comes into the service and, and he's praying and he says, Lord, bend me, bend me. And all of a sudden God bends him. And God shows him all of, all of the Welch community. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the story goes that God said, do you believe that I can give you 100,000 souls in two weeks? And he says, I believe. So he turns to the man that was with him beside him in the service and he said, this is what God showed me. God showed me all of a, all like a map of Welch and he said he would give me a hundred thousand souls. Do you believe me? You know what the man said? He said, I agree. I believe. And it came to pass. And I'm reading about this man and how his life was. And I'm reading about Finney and, and the revivals that come off Finney. And I'm reading about these men. But you know what? That generation is dead and gone. The Bible says that David served his generation. So guess what we have to do this morning? We've got to serve our generation. And I'll be honest, I don't know what it looks like, but we've read enough and we've prayed enough and we've asked enough questions. You know what time it is? It's time to actually walk this out and begin to fight instead of laying back and thinking about fighting and, and wondering how to fight and even reading on how to fight and still not actually engaging in the conflict. Because the story goes like this. Look in verse 12. And David was the son of an Ephraite from Bethlehem, Judah, named, <clears throat> named Jesse. And to him were eight sons, and the man was an old man in the days of Saul. And the three oldest sons of Jesse went out and, saw, and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of the three sons that followed the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the second was Abinadab, 
and the third was Shema. And David was the youngest, and the three oldest sons followed Saul. And David went out, and he returned from the Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near that morning and evening and presented himself for forty days. And Jesse said to the son David, Please take for your brothers an ephah this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of your brothers. And carry these ten cuttings of cheese to the commander of their thousands and see how your brothers are faring and bring me some word or some token from them. And Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and he left the sheep with the keeper and he got up and he went to see as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the barricade and to the army which was going out to fight, shouting a battle cry. Actually, in King James, I think it says, and he shouted for the battle. So when David comes down and he sees all of Israel and all the Philistines and they're in battle array and they're getting ready to fight, David shouted for the battle. That's what it says. And David rose up in the morning. I'm sorry, verse uh, number 22. And David left his baggage in the hand of the keeper, and he ran to the army, and he greeted his brothers. And he was speaking with them. Then behold, the man, the champion man named Goliath, the Philistine of Gath, came out of the ranks of the Philistine, and he spoke according to these words, and David heard. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they ran from him and were very much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the shame from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies? Of the living God. And that where the Bible says the battle is not ours, it's what? It's his. And the people answered him the same, saying, It shall be done to the man who kills him. And his oldest brother Eliab spoke when he saw the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down here, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know the pride and the naughtiness of your heart. For you have come down now to see the battle. And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? That's a good thought, ain't it? Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for me to come down here? Is there not a reason for me to shout for the battle? Is there not a reason for me to look at this Philistine and says, Why is it that he's coming and charging the, all of Israel and nobody's standing up? What will happen if this Philistine dies? What will happen to the man? Is there not a cause? And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him towards another man and spoke according to this word. And the people answered him again the same way. And the words which David spoke were heard. And they were told before to Saul, and he sent out for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail you because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine and fight him, for you are a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Your servant has kept his father's sheep. And there came in a lion and a bear, and they took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after them and struck him and delivered the lamb out of his mouth. And when it rose up against me, I caught it by the beard and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since, this is the reason, he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who has delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Amen. David has what? Zeal. David has faith. And so he says, Listen. And he begins to tell him about some experiences that he had. But you know what? Something else I, I think John Paul pointed out to me last night. We were reading over this. And he said, Daddy, didn't this all happen? After David was anointed king? I said, it did. 
You'll find the man of God coming down and, and looking over all the sons of Jesse one day. And, and the eldest comes in and Samuel says, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me now. And God said, Don't you look on appearance. Amen. And so they all passed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And he says, Is this all that you have? And he said, Well, I've got one more. He's a young man, but he's out there with the sheep. He said, I can't do nothing till you go get him. So they sent for him. And when David walked in, he took the horn of oil, amen, and he poured it upon David. David's head and anointed that man king. And from that time, David's life was changed. I believe it was after that time is when he's out sitting with the sheep and he's under the trees and he's out there watching over the flock. And here comes a lion and it runs up and it grabs one of the lambs. And here comes David. He jumps to his feet and he takes off after the after this lion. And however he catches up, I'm not sure. But he grabs him by the beard and slays this lion and brings the lamb back. And again, another time a bear done the same thing. And David wasn't afraid of the lion. And David wasn't afraid of the bear. And he looks at this Philistine and says, Listen, you're coming against the armies of the living God. And you can't do that and get away with it. For God is strong for His name. I'm not coming to you in flesh and blood but I'm coming to you in His name. Amen. So he looks at King Saul and says, I may be a youth and I may not look the part, but this uncircumcised Philistine would be just like the lion and the bear because he's defied the armies of God. And I wonder where is that rising up on the inside of us? The church at large is being beat to death. That's the truth. Just like people we, heard, we were praying for this morning. So close. And yet the Satan comes like a raging, roaring lion. And like a bear. And like a wolf. And tries to snatch away. Where is the one that will jump up and say, Not on my watch. Not right now. And so this war that we're fighting is a holy war. And you can't fight it in flesh and blood. You can only fight it in the Spirit of God. And so what I saw was this. After David's anointing came upon him, he was able to go out and fight. And now David is brought, you know, who knows what David was thinking when he was just carrying the ten cheeses down and all this flour and corn and stuff down to the brothers. And he sees the battle and he shouts for it because he's excited about Israel and about King Saul and about Jonathan and about his brothers fighting the battles for God. He was excited and he shouts. And it gets the attention of everybody else. Right, John Paul? He gets their attention. It's a holy war. But the rest of Israel were doing what? They were entrenched. I wonder if it's kind of like the pool of Siloam whenever they were all waiting and they were waiting for the moving of the water. And, and you know, sometimes there would be an angel come down and trouble the water and the first one in got healed. And Yeshua comes walking through the midst of them and he says, you know, will you be made whole? And he says, well, I have no man to put me in the water when the water is troubled. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And then when the water is finally troubled, somebody steps in before me. And I have no man to help me. And Yeshua looks at the man. What's he say? Be healed. Stand on your feet. Pick up your bed. Go home and tell what God had done for you. But this man laid there. I think it was what? 28 years. Waiting for the moving of the water. All of Israel is entrenched and encamped. Waiting for somebody to stand up. Because when Goliath shows his face. They were all afraid. They didn't want to fight him. Could you imagine a man nine foot or so tall? Probably his shield was at least a hundred pounds, I would guess. However, 6,000 shekels of bronze would weigh. That's pretty heavy. His chain mail had a helmet on, his staff. He had greaves on it. means his shins and everything were covered all the way up. He was impenetrable except for one spot. Amen. Amen. One spot, which was right here. So the other day I was doing some study on, you know, this sling, a shepherd's sling. You know, I asked Timothy, I said, what do you think a shepherd's sling looks like? He said, it looks like a Y and you pull it back and you shoot it. I said, well, that is a slingshot, but that's not what David had. And so I began to research, you know, we always got all these weird pictures and they try to, you know, depict what that was looking like. But this man went to, it to it, over to Israel and he was watching the shepherds and they still use those. And this is the way they would use them. They're about as wide as your to finger to finger. 
and they would, throw, they would do this. And then when they would sling it, the Bible says they could hit within a hair's breadth. And so I watched men as they tried to aim it and throw it, and they could hit a tree or something. But this one guy, when he would do this, all of a sudden I got a picture of David running to meet the giant. And as he's running, he's doing this. And when he lets the stone go, it hits Goliath right here in the head. He falls down on his face. David don't even have a sword. Remember Goliath? He said, what is it you're coming to me with a stick? Am I a dog? That you would come to me with a stick? He said, I'll feed you to the fowls of the air. And David speaks up and says, listen, you've defied the armies of the living God. Today, I'm going to feed your carcass and all the carcass of the Philistines to the fowls of the air that you might know that there's a God in Israel. Amen. And it happens just like David said it would happen. Not because David is anything outside of God, but God was using this young man. So take that story and let's put it in 2017 here, whatever day it is, I don't forgot. It's 11th. Sorry, Lexi. November the 11th. <laughs> November the 11th. I knew what day it was. Lexi's birthday. Yeah. <clears throat> 21 years ago she was born. But I want to make a practical application to that because that's what's on my heart. Amen. You know, the other day uh, we started the bus ministry up and I took the bus down and... I'm wondering, Brother Ken, who's going to come? Because we see a lot of faces. And a lot of faces we see every year. And the first one on the bus was Fred. A man that we've seen year after year after year. And I noticed his hair was real greasy. And I said, hey, Fred, what you doing? He said, ah. I said, are you still in the John Severe? He said, no, I lost, my, I lost my place. He said, I'm back out on the streets. And, you know, this man used to heat his tent with a candle. We'd bring him candles in the wintertime, and he'd take a candle and put it in his tent, and that's how he stayed warm. And then people started to get on the bus, and I've seen a man that I, uh, I ministered to not long ago on the side of the streets, and I, me and this other uh, preacher went out. I said, let's just go walk the streets and talk, and uh, talk to people. And the first man I come upon is this little, um, his name is Brandon Muncy, Brad Muncy. And he's all strung out. He's all messed up. He can't even hardly talk. So we take him next door. We feed him. We share the gospel with him. I said, listen, I know where there's a rehab at. It'll take you. And he said, "Let me." He said, I, give me his number and I'll call him. Well, I gave him the number. I said, please call him. If you need a ride, call me. I'll take you. And um, about a week or two later, I'm at a music store over here in Johnson City, Honeycutt Music, and there he is trying to buy a guitar. And he's all messed up. He can't even hardly walk. And I go outside and he sits in the car and he fusses at his girlfriend, slams the door and walks off. And I say, how you doing, honey? And she's like, we're not doing good. She said, ever since I met this young man, she said, it's been, she said, I've never done drugs any. She said, I've been a school teacher all my life. And she said, now because of him, I'm probably going to lose my job. He died last week and I revived him and now he's cussing me and, he, and he's mad at me. And then this week I see him crawl on the bus. I said, you still using? He said, yeah, a little, but not like I used to. And so we've got a war to fight, but it takes, it takes you to fight it. You know, it's easy to be in our trench and, and read about how men went out and changed the world and how men and women went out and preached the gospel and shared the gospel and fed and clothed and done all these things. And, you know, we keep gaining knowledge and we get their insight into how their life was and what it looked like. And we'll pick up another book and we'll read about this man and how he prayed and where he went and how he changed things. But yet we're still in our trench. We're not getting out of the trench. We're not going out to where they're actually at. I mean, they're right out the door and they need help. And we're in the trench reading how to help them. But when we leave, we don't ever help them. And we brush shoulders with them. And we talk to them. 
You know, it's been on my heart and I'm praying that God will help me that I want to start walking around Johnson City every day if it takes it. And that's asking God for revival, a real revival, not some, not a series of meetings, not a bunch of people hollering and screaming and saying it's good, but life changing power to be given to his people and to those around it, because that's what we need. The reason why the church and us and everybody's in the state it's in is because we're lacking something. The, what we lack is the presence of Almighty God. He's the changer. He's the Savior. He's the one that changes people. He's the one that changed my life. I went and seen a lady in jail this week, and I'm talking to her. And matter of fact, if it wasn't for her, we probably wouldn't even be here. Because I, you know, God was dealing with me about the Sabbath and the feast, and I'm praying in the woods, and I come and tell my wife all that I saw and what God showed me. She said, I think I know somebody that goes to a congregation like that. I said, Well, call her. So she calls her. She calls uh, Sister Delora, and they, we meet with them and follow them up to the vineyard. And that's where we've been ever since. So I'm sitting there, and I know this young lady. And she's like, Tom, I need prayer. She said, I keep falling back in the same place. She said, I don't know what to do. She said, you ever read that scripture where they turned over to a reprobate mind? I said, I've read that. She said, I don't want that to happen to me. I said, that's good that you feel that way. Because it's true. You know, I mean, that's a hard scripture and we could take a, a break and, and stay on that. But that's the truth. They are some people on the earth that have walked so far. They've walked away from God and God doesn't call them. That's the truth. That's not good preaching, but that's the truth. Yes. And that should strike a holy fear that it might be one that you, you know, brush up against. You know, I seen a lady yesterday on the streets and I'm talking to her and she, or she walks by. I said, what is your name? She said, Alicia. I said, I thought so. I said, you, were, you come on the bus last year. Do you remember? And she said, I remember. I said, um, Last time I saw you was at Dean Presnell's church, True Gospel Baptist Church, church on Gap Creek. She said, yeah. I said, your dad's like a, a member. And she said, yeah. She's like, well, I got to go. And I thought, there's no change coming on people. It's a war. It's a fight. The reason our children and our parents and our loved ones are unchanged is because we're not fighting like we should fight. Amen. We're not. We're reading how to fight. We're asking others, will you fight for me because I really don't want to fight. That's what it is sometimes when we ask others to pray. It's because we're unwilling to pray like we ought to. Because we know if we get down to business with God and we really push everything out of the way and we get serious with God, God answers. God does mighty things, but we know what it costs. And I know I preach like that a lot, a lot of times because that's what's on my heart. I, we know what it's going to take to get God to move in certain areas of our life and in others' life. And it's like that's a great big war. And as soon as we start... All of a sudden there's a battle and we think, what in the world is going on? I wanted to get close to God. And all of a sudden it's like God jumped 500 feet away from me. And I wanted so and so to be saved. But now they're more angry and more mad than they've ever been. Well, listen, that's because there's a war going on. And you're getting a hold of God, but you're getting a hold of somebody else as well. And his name is Satan. And he hates you and I. Amen. John Bunyan's book was written about a holy war. And this is the town, man's soul is the town. Man's soul had it and it was all established and well built. And there was five gates, the ear gate, the nose gate, the eye gate, or the eye gate, the ears, the eye gate, the ear gate, the nose gate, the mouth gate, and the field gate. And this is the only way that Diabolus can get into the city because it's fast shut up everywhere else. He cannot come in except invited. And so the first gate he goes to is what? The ear gate. And he begins to lay accusations and he begins to call. And this is the first thing he done. He told the men of the, the town of Mansoul that their king didn't have it all together for them like he had stated he did. And you know what they did? They dropped the resistance. Mr. Resistance, the chief captain in the city, was shot and killed. And all of a sudden resistance was taken out of the way. 
And he goes on and describes the holy war because the war is after man's soul. And so I think sometimes you and I, I'm talking to me, me, I, forget how grave the battle is and what it is we're fighting against and what it is we're really fighting for. You're fighting for either your soul or the soul of somebody you love. Amen. That's what you're fighting for. And the reason why it gets so hot and so heated is because when Satan and the angels were cast out of God's presence and out of God's favor, they are eternally enshamed. The book of Enoch, which is just extra biblical writing, speaks of these angels walking with their face looking down because they dare not look to the heavens because when they look up, they see the judgment of Almighty God predicted on them and they will not look up to the heaven. Isn't it interesting when you and I are downcast, what do we do? We're looking down and we don't look up because if we look up, it gives us hope. You look into the sky, you might have hope, you might get mercy, you pray. But those angels, they don't look up because they know their hope is not going to ever come. And so whenever you and I are praying and we're seeking the favor of God in somebody's life or in our own life, there's also somebody that's listening. And I wonder if it truly is like a battle. Where if Brother Kerry was saying, listen, I need you to go, God, I need you to go over here and do this. All of a sudden, there's a familiar spear that hears that, runs to their king and says, listen, he's trying to get fortified in this area. We've got to send somebody. We've got to send something to fight. Go over and make him mad. Go over and push Kerry around a little bit. Go make things that won't work out, that he forgets there's a holy war and he gets focused in his trench and he don't look outside of what's going on and then he'll forget about the battle and it'll go away. And then the battle comes back up later and then you think, I forgot to pray. I forgot that there's a battle. How long do you think these men, 40 days and 40 nights, sitting in the trench, they probably got even tired of going out and seeing Goliath come up and show his face. Every day, there's Goliath. They would run off. They would hide in the trenches. The next day, they would, here he comes again, right on time, threatening the children of God. And nobody would stand up to him. And I know partly a little bit why that is. We don't like to lead. We like to follow. Because leading gets us in trouble. You know why? Because all of a sudden there's nobody to take the bullet for us. Now the bullseye is right on our heart and on our back. And now we're the one that they're going to talk about. You know, it's interesting to me that such a revival that happened under Finney that they would be modern day preachers that would call him a heretic. I still can't get over that. John MacArthur would call Charles Finney a heretic. You know why? Because he didn't fit in the box. Matter of fact, Finney, when he got converted and he got saved and he got changed, his pastor said, listen, don't tell nobody that you've been sitting under me. Don't tell nobody you go to my church. Don't tell nobody I trained you to preach because you don't do it like I want you to do it. And then later on, this same pastor comes to Charles Finney and said, if you'd have listened to me and took my advice, you would not have seen what you saw. And you would not have experienced the revival like you did if you would have listened to me. So this is what Brother Ken shared with me last week. And I still, I, it, you know, it's kind of like, I know it's the Lord's will and I know it was God's message to me, but still, how do you walk it out? If you can't look to the back, to the past, and you don't really look side to side because we know that sometimes when we look to the right and to the left, they're not doing what God's telling us to do and we get off track. And so you know what it makes us do? Absolutely dependent upon God. Just like David. David comes to a fight with a slingshot. A slingshot. And a rock or two or three or four or five. He had five rocks, you know what I'm saying? They've got shields, bow and arrow. You know, but David could have got a bow. He could have got a javelin. He could have got every other weapon he could have wanted. But what did he say? I've not proved them. I've not proved them yet. You know what weapon we have that we have proved, but I think we neglect? Prayer. 
We know. You know, even like Lexi, I remember um, when she was just a little girl, probably, I don't know how old she was at the time, but we would, you know, we would ask our children questions, you know, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? And, you know, it was always that experience they had away from us at Bible school or camp that was the real one that got them in, you know. And yet they're fussing and fighting and all this other stuff, you know. And, and so I just, I wasn't ever comfortable with Lexi saying, yeah, Daddy, I'm saved. It would break my heart because I knew she was lying to me. But she was telling me what she wanted me to know and hear. And so I was teaching Sunday school at a certain church in Johnson City. And that morning God had laid the youth on my heart. Not Lexi, the youth. And so I came in that morning and I'm supposed to teach on something. I don't know what it was. I said, listen, church, I've, I've really got a burden for the youth. And Brother Ron, there's a sister jumped up. And she said, you know what? I've had a burden all morning for the youth. I said, well, let's just take a little bit of time and pray. And we prayed. Amen. We prayed. Serviced. We went through the Sunday school. We've been praying most of it. About that time we started singing and God shows up during the singing. I mean, God is dealing with hearts. All of a sudden, guess who's hitting the altar? All the youth. Here they come. One, two, three, four. Then some of the parents are coming. They're crying. And all of a sudden, Pastor Kenny gets up and he's walking around and he's preaching the gospel. And he comes to Lexi and she's there crying. And, she's, and Pastor Kenny looks at Lexi and says, Is it well with your soul? Is it, did you, are you saved? She's like, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know what he said? He said, You just keep on praying. And he left her. We don't like to do that. But that's the truth. Leave them alone with God for a little while. Leave them alone. You can't tell them what they need to hear. God has to speak to them. And so he goes off and other people are coming and going from the altar. He comes back to her and he says, Lexi, is it well? Did you get through? She said, I, I don't know. He said, you just keep on praying. And I'm back there. I'm just, you know, I'm about chewing the ends of my fingers off. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is something I've asked God for. And I'm praying. I'm wondering, is it, what is going on? One of the sisters go up and they begin to pray with Lexi. And, uh, and Brother Kenny comes back and he says, Lexi, is it well? She said, it is well. It's done. And ever since that hour, I'm telling you, there was a change in her life. Matter of fact, she got up and said this. Does this mean I've got to be good to my brothers and sisters? I thought, if God drove that nail all the way home, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that hit rock bottom. If she's going to look at my brother and sister and say, you mean I got to do better with them? Even they said, does this mean you're going to treat us better? That's how solid it went. And she's been changed ever since then. That's the truth. And I'll tell you the truth. I was running the pews. I was on the pews. I was jumping around. I was back in the corner by myself, you know, having me a fit because I saw God do something that I absolutely needed Him and wanted Him to do. And people joined in with my burden and we saw it come to pass. That's what it takes. So we have a holy war to fight. And our, you know, it's interesting, we, we are given some scriptural armor, if you will, in the book of Ephesians. And something I never saw before, you know, dealing with the helmet and the shield and the loins girded, girded with truth and, and the sword of the Spirit and their, and their feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I never thought about this, but Satan has his counterfeit. And as I was reading the book of Holy War, he begins, Satan begins to unfold to his, his legion how he keeps the saints and those that are outside of God down. And it was the shield of unbelief. It was the, hard, it was the, it was the helmet of a hard heart. And I thought, my word, that has to be right. The shield of unbelief. Unbelief will black every sky. Unbelief will steal every joy. Unbelief will cripple every mercy of God. Even the Bible declares that when Yeshua came to a certain place, He could not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So somehow their unbelief stopped even the presence of the Son of God to manifest itself because they did not believe. 
I remember reading about John Bunyan years ago. I was reading a book called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, which was me at that time. I mean, I'm struggling like I'd never struggled before. And God brought me that book into my life. And, you know, I, I, I talk about these guys like they're my friends. They are my friends. They've helped me. And I'm reading this book and he starts talking about unbelief. And I thought, oh, my God, I never saw it. it I mean, I knew I had to believe, but I couldn't believe. I didn't believe. And it was still in every joy. And a hard heart. You know, that's... I don't know if you've ever heard of the Bohemian Grove. But it's a wicked place. And every year they do a human sacrifice. But one of the things that they pray for is that care would be gone. Care, genuine care for one another would be vanquished and gone. So they pray against the spirit of caring. And the only thing that can come if that's gone is what? An uncaring, hard, hateful spirit. And I know people. And I remember ministering to this, young, this certain man and, and I'm trying to you know, win him to the Lord. I'm working for him and I hurt my back and I'm down to my back. But I think I still got to go and finish this screened in porch that I'm building for him. And we, you know, we kind of squabble every now and then because he wants to cuss all day and drink all day. And I'm not like that. And I asked him, I said, why don't you invite the Lord in your heart? He said, I don't want the Lord in my heart. But he told me right before that he was a Christian and that he was saved. And he was going to heaven after he drunk a half a case of beer and told me he didn't want God anywhere near his heart. His heart was so hard. Like adamant stone. And so the only thing that can break that is the Spirit of God. Amen. The only thing that can take the shield of unbelief off of somebody to where they'll actually look up and believe is the Spirit of God. The only one that can take our sword of rebellion and hatred and anger where we don't want God to tell us what to do anymore is the presence of Almighty God. Because in my life, that's what it took. And in your life, if you're a Christian and you're saved, you know what I mean. God had to break all those things down in your own life to where you could look and believe and surrender. And when you surrendered, what happened? There was joy that flooded your soul. And you thought, why, what in the world took me so long to surrender to God? Why did I fight Him? Why did I cuss and carry on? Why did I look at the church in a bad light? Why did I say those evil things? And you know what it was? Because you didn't believe. And you had a hard heart. And you had a shield of unbelief up. And my prayer this morning is that God would tear that down from you and strip you of that and allow you to have something you've never had before. Peace. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give unto you. My peace I give to you. Joy. Joy. Don't those just sound good? Peace. Joy. Love. My dad hated his dad. And his dad hated his dad. I don't know what it is about that generation. I think it was a hard time. Men were brought up hard. They suffered hard things. My dad said, you know, his dad would, was rough. And so it made his heart hard. And I remember saying, Daddy, why don't you just forgive your daddy? Now, his daddy had passed away a long time ago. <coughs> he said, I'll never forgive him. Never. And I thought, how this war is raging... And we don't understand all these little wounds we're getting and we're holding on to resentment and we're letting unforgiveness take our life and, and we're doing all these things and we're unwilling just to surrender and quit and stop and say, God, listen, I've had enough. I need help. Amen. I wonder if the army of Israel was praying in the trenches. Lord, let somebody stand up. Let somebody be raised up. You know, in the 1904 Welch Revival, the ministers were praying. You know what they were praying? Raise up a man that's not a pastor, that's not a minister, that's not in the church. Raise up a man to do something. And guess what? Robert Evans was raised up. Evan Roberts was raised up and God used him. Not even, even a part of the church was brought in and God done great and mighty things to this man. Here comes a little shepherd boy 
the young man, he comes into the camp. Even his oldest brother don't want him there. And I wonder if his oldest brother had a problem even later submitting to king dad, you know, king brother over there. <laughs> How hard would it be? You know, some of us, it wouldn't be so hard, but others, it'd be a hard thing to bow the knee to our brother. Especially, John Paul, if he's younger. Amen? I'm the younger brother. So I can say that. You know, I look up to my brother. He's always been a good man. He's always been a valiant man. He's always done exceeding above me in every area. So I look up to him. So it might be a little bit harder for him to look up to me. Because I've made a thousand mistakes and stumbled and fallen on the way. But there's a holy war going on. And we've got to be fitted for this war. And we've got to understand that it is what? It's a war. When you're, when you're praying for somebody, you're waging war. When you're pushing the meals away and the sleep away and you're getting up and you're spending time with God, that's a war. Because you're going to war against sleep. You're going to war against your mind wandering. You know, I'm sitting out in the woods and I'm not far from the house this morning. And, uh, you know, God always sends something to, to kind of, I guess, give me some comfort Used to, my old dog would go with me. I could walk back a half a mile in the woods and be gone 30, 45 minutes an hour. And here he'd run down the path. And at night, I don't know what's running down the path at me. I'm hoping it's my dog. And <laughs> praise the Lord, it was my dog. And he'd run and lay at my feet. Amen. And I'd pray for a little while and he'd run off and I'd hear him chase something. I'm thinking, dear God, I know it's a bear. And that's why I'm thinking, if God can't save me from a bear, He sure as the world ain't going to save me from hell and the devil. So I'd push that thought out of my mind and I'd keep on praying. But so I'm praying this morning, here comes two of my cats. Or I'm thinking, I like that cat, but that cat right there, I could just... <laughs> and it's the one craw crawling under me like, hey, I got your bag. I'm thinking, I don't need your back. <laughs> I thought, how long it's been since I've been out away from all the noise of stuff and just prayed. And I even felt as I prayed there, an unwillingness to stay long. I'm cold. I had several layers on too. Gloves. I had my Jamaican toboggan on. I had a hat on. Two pair of pants. And I'm sitting out there. And it's, you know, it's early in the morning. The sun's not up yet. And I'm praying. And I thought, man, I miss this. I miss it. And I began to pray for some of the requests made Wednesday night. And I began to pray for Katie. And she came on my heart. And Others came on my heart. And I just, I thought how, I listened to a message this morning as well. His name is um, Hanley Milby. He's an old man of God. And he said, he gets a lot of phone calls from men asking how to have the holy anointing. This man has it. And he says, increase your prayer life. He said, but pastor, I'm praying an hour a day. He said, I said, increase your prayer life. He said, if you want it, he said, I'd love to be able to share some of the experiences that's, ha that's happened to me over in the pine thicket. But he said, I would never do it unless God tells me I can. So I'm wondering, brother, what in the world does this man saw as he's been alone seeking God? What has God shown him? Has God even shown himself to him? You know, I'm not, listen, I'll be honest and I may be wrong. I am not outside the idea that God can show himself to us. I'm not outside that. I believe if we get in earnest and we seek Him and that's our heart's desire, God will do that. Now, if we just want to see it so we can brag about it, we'll never see Him. But if our heart is pure and we're really needing God, God will show up. I believe that with all of my heart. But I believe we don't press in. And I'm talking about me to the fight. How long does men have to, you know, to train? Brother Jeff was in the military. Other Brother Steve was in the military. There might have been others. You go through a season of training and you get a certain amount of experience before they send you out. Then guess where you get the rest of the experience? Out. That's where you get it. So you know when you get saved, God brings you in and He loves on you real good and all of a sudden He backs away for a little bit and you think the world's falling off. And then God brings you back and He restores some of the comforts to you. And then He backs away again. And then you go seeking Him again. And then you come back. And all of a sudden, all this while, like we were talking about this morning, your faith is being increased. You're building these things up. You're getting stronger in the Lord. Some of the things you used to be tempted with doesn't tempt you like it used to. And the places you used to stumble, you're not stumbling quite as bad as you used to. And you're progressively going. And it's not for us to stop. 
and get comfortable and complacent and say, you know, I've reached a satisfying place. I'm not dabbling in sin like I used to. I know what I'm, where I'm going to need to be, but I'm in this good place where I can pray and I believe God's listening. I can read the Bible and it speaks to me every now and again and I can still eat and sleep and I can do all the things I want to do. And I believe God is calling us away from that again to fight this holy war. Because there are people, honestly, that really need the touch of God. And so they asked that man, what do you got to do to have the holy anointing? And it's increase your prayer life. That's how you wage war. That's how you fight. And when you walk out, when you leave prayer, and you've been with God, you have life to offer somebody. You don't speak so rashly, so hastily, so negatively. I was thinking this morning, you know, gosh, how much, how many times have I offended the Lord with my mouth? And I don't cuss and carry on, but just negative and doubt and fear and unbelief spewing out. And I think, Lord, I, I don't, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. I, I, I'd gotten dead to it. You know, I'd just been so used to it. It'd been part of my life. I didn't know. I did know, but you know, it didn't bother me. It didn't convict me like it used to and like I'm asking God to do. And so you know the, you know the armor. We know that the sword is a, the Spirit. The helmet is the helmet of salvation or deliverance. The shield of faith. You've got to be firm with the truth and you're walking in peace. And as you're doing this, you're praying. You know, I got to meet with a pastor and some other men this week and we started a, a prayer every Tuesday night. He's just walking into this the way we believe. You know, he's, he's, on, the, he's on the diet thing right now. You know, eating clean and unclean. And I said, yeah. I said, if you keep on studying, you'll get to where you can't even eat cheese. He said, brother. He said, just, I'm trying. I don't need to hear about cheese right now. He said, I'm struggling with ham and pork, okay? He said, don't tell me about cheese. I thought, but just don't worry about it, brother. Just, you know. But he's beginning to do this. So all of a sudden, there's a lot of things that he's battling and warring and fighting against. And so we met and we prayed. And it was a good time of prayer. And I thought, you know, this is something God has laid on my heart for years and years is just to get people together and pray. You know, we'll get together and sing. We surely will get together and eat. But if we call for an all night prayer, the people are few, myself included, because it's work and it's warfare. And so I want to encourage you this morning that this battle that we're fighting is worth our effort. It's worth our prayer. Whoever it is that is in our sight that we're wanting God to do something for or in, it's worth it. It's worth it this morning to wage holy warfare. And so some of the battle is our own because our town of Mansoul may be a little bit out of kilter and some of the the main men, some of the head men in the town of Mansoul, like Mr. Resistance and Mr. Innocent, may be not doing so well. Because we've let things creep in. Maybe we've got a helmet of unbelief or a shield of unbelief on instead of the shield of faith. You know, maybe we're not carrying this sword of the Spirit, but we've got the sword of the flesh and we're cutting people left and right with our tongue. And we should be gracious. And we're not battling in the spirit, but we're battling in the flesh. You know what happens when you fight in the flesh? You get tired and aggravated. Period. Don't you? You get fed up. Why ain't this working? You know, I never forget. I hope Brother Ken don't mind, but he always tells the story about one time when he was fasting and his family was eating. He said, I'm trying to be holy here. I thought about that the other day. How I have done that, you know, I'm trying to fast and pray and 
the children ain't acting right, my wife ain't acting right, and the church ain't acting right, and all these things. And I'm like, what is all of your, don't you see, you are the reason I can't be holy. <laughs> then I walk away and think, you big dummy, you're the reason they can't be holy. So we got to get something figured out. Thank you for that illustration, Ken, because I'm telling you, I hit home because I thought if it wasn't, if he didn't say it was him, he'd definitely been talking about me. Because that's the truth. Sometimes in our grandest attempts to be holy, we are hard and critical and we cut. I mean, we got good intentions. We're trying to get to God and we're going to make God hear our prayer, whether he wants to or not. And in the process, what God is Morning is like, I guess maybe this morning. This is what God laid on my heart when I got there. Just be quiet. I started to pray and I couldn't hardly say anything. I wanted to pray something this and talk about this. And I thought, I just shut up. And I just sit there for I don't know how long and didn't say nothing. I thought, Lord, I can't even, I can't even pray. You know, because praying is a gift. We can talk. We can say a lot of words. But prayer... When it's God breathed and it's coming out of you and it's full of life and it's full of compassion and it's full of zeal and it's changing you and them, sometimes is rare in our life because it costs us something. We know we have to stop eating so much and sleeping so much and we'll have to cut things out of our life and we don't want to do that. <clears throat> Like the man of God said this morning as I was listening, God's people are peculiar people. And if they're not peculiar, you know what he said? They're probably not God's man. Because they just do things outside the box and you can't quite put your finger on it. Because maybe God's leading them outside the box. And I thought about what revivals I've heard of and all the men have the same experience. They got in contact with God in a mighty way and they didn't do it like everybody told them to do it. And so pre-adventure, God would move on your heart and mine. It may not look like what you think it'll look like. This war may not play out like you think it should play out. But the results will be the results you're desiring if you fight God's way. Remember when Gideon was going to go fight and God weeded them down and weeded them down and weeded them down to just a handful like the dirty dozen standing there with Gideon and they've got a trumpet in one hand, here we go again, and a lamp in the other. I mean, at least David had a rock. Gideon had a trumpet and a lamp inside of a vessel. And God said, listen, when you hear the sound of the wind blowing through the mulberry bushes, then you'll know I'm going to fight for you. And about that time, he says, when I blow the trumpet and smash my lamp, I want you all to do the same thing and shout the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And so whenever Gideon stood up and he blew the trumpet and he took and he busted the outer cover of the light and the light shined and all of them began to do that, God began to fight and it wrought a good, great miracle because they fought God's way. Now, how many of you would do that? Go get a tr shofar and a candle or a lamp or something and go down to the next place you're going to fight and say, all right, boys, I'm here to fight. <laughs> you may have your nine millimeter strapped to your back and all this stuff, but I'm going to blow my shofar. I'm going to light this candle. I'm going to sound the gospel, the trumpet. And I'm going to let my light shine in your face until God does something. And Gideon wrought a good work for the Lord. And he fought the battles of the Lord. So I know I've kept you long enough. But it's a holy war we're fighting. Right, John Paul? You're smiling back there. I kept you, kept you fought long enough? <laughs> Boys Holloway, son. That's a battle in itself, amen? <laughs> but I want to encourage you, I do. I want to... Um, you know, one time God laid something on my heart and I, um, I wanted to express it to the church. And I didn't know how. And so I wrote 70 letters and I went and put them on 70 church doors, put a piece of tape, stuck it on the front door and left it there, wrote pastor on it. 70 churches in Elizabethan. 
And one of the pastors I knew called me. And he said, you've got me tore all to pieces, brother. I don't understand why you're rebuking me. And I said, I'm not rebuking you. This is a burden that was on my heart. And he said, well, maybe you should come and preach and let people hear what you have to say. And I thought, he's right. In that area, he's right. And so my burden this morning is this. If we don't do something, who is? If you don't go out and face the Goliath in your life, in your family, and in your community, who's going to do it? If you don't take charge of your life, there's not going to be somebody raised up to take charge for you. You've got to do it. And if somebody in our family is out, you're the one to go get them. If somebody in our community or church is out, it's my responsibility to go. And as we go, we've got to learn to pray and wait. Amen? Amen. It's a holy war. Amen. It's a holy fight. Yes, it is. But the spoils are grander than you can ever imagine. Hallelujah. It's people's souls. Let that sink in. It's somebody's eternal soul that will benefit from our waging war against sin, the flesh, and the devil. Will we win every fight? I know we'll win the fight. And God's done mighty things in the past, has He not? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for Your mercy. And Lord, I, I, I ask, God, start with me in this congregation, Lord. What does it look like, Lord, when You are so overwhelmingly upon a man or a woman. What do they look like, Lord? What do they walk like? I know there's certain things that are unchangeable, Lord. You're still holy and men that walk with You are holy and women that walk with You are holy. But in this generation that we live, we need help, Lord. We need a fresh anointing from You, Lord, that carries us into the prayer closet. We need a fresh anointing, Lord, like Yeshua said, to cut off the right hand and pluck out the right eye. We need a holy anointing, Lord, that we may be able with compassion in our heart and tears in our eyes, go and convince the sinners, those out of covenant, of their great need. And so, Lord, whatever that looks like, would you give it to us, Lord? However it comes, Lord, because we can look in the past and we can read Scripture and we can read books and we can even think about our own lives, Lord. And those things are good aids. But, Lord, we need your help. So, Lord, I ask for a revival of heart in my life. I ask for a revival in this church, in this Father, I ask for a revival in Johnson City on the streets in the homeless community in John Sevier. I ask God, please, for a revival in the Tri-Cities area. God, a real God-breathed revival where revival is in the church, it's in the workplace, it's on the side of the road, it's going up and down the road. It doesn't matter where it's at, but people are truly, God, being changed. And your name is honored and glorified. And Lord, I know it ain't about up to me. It's up to you and your people. So Father, wake us up and help us to pray and seek you for it. And believe you with waiting. God, we thank you for this day and we praise you and we bless you. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen.